Hello and welcome to Virtual Thoughts episode um, number 20 or so. I'm here with I, uh, J- uh, CTO of IO Fabric, Ryan, and I'm not going to pronounce your last name. So, Ryan, if you could give me a, your last name. Uh, Sagariasen. Okay. I'm not even going to reprodu- <laughs> I'm not even try to reproduce that one. It's a great yeah, name. Fine. You always know when people know who you are because they pronounce it right. Oh, they they stumble before they even start, so that's fine. Oh, mine's the same way. I get people stumbling over my last name all the time. The um, so we want to talk about the future of the data center. And now I have my view of it, and I have my view of the cloud. Mm-hmm. We're years away from my view. Mm-hmm. Um, but when you start thinking about the future of the data center, we need to limit ourselves, I think, because. A telco data center, which is what most clouds are, is a very different data center than somebody a business would use. Mm -hmm. One has a when you think about the depth and breadth of networking, that's just not there in the average business. So, what do you think the data center of the future is going to look like? Well, it's it's an interesting slippery slope. It kind of depends on how how far you go down that slope. But let's start at the beginning. I think uh, you're going to end up with uh, sort of the the, the dog's breakfast mix of things that you have already and a much, much easier way of of managing it. So if you think about it from a very high level perspective, the the way um, systems evolve, especially if they are functional systems and objective systems, is towards greater efficiency of some kind. And there are... Uh, very limited ways you can achieve greater efficiency. One is through um, automation or intelligence. Another is through restricting what you're trying to deal with. And we've seen lots of examples of the the second option in the last few years with things like uh, hub converged infrastructure that comes in boxes and things like that, which is sort of the knee-jerk reaction to making life simpler for yourself. I think... Um, our management technologies are going to evolve to the point where that's no longer going to be the, the only or preferred way of accomplishing things. And we'll end up with um, a data center that is effectively one computer as far as all of its users are concerned. And in order to accomplish that, obviously, you have to um, take a few leaps in terms of automation and integration compared to where most people are today. When you start thinking about it from that perspective, a system of systems effectively, right. I I think HCI is, is, I'm not sure if it's knee-jerk is the right word. I wouldn't have called it that. I actually would think it's more short-lived mm-hmm. in that it's too small to grow in a cost-effective manner. Well, it's it's a convenient solution today because it's something that you can put together, right? It's something you can always put together in order to uh, try to manage a complex problem. True, uh, but the problem is going to get the problem is getting more complex. I mean, if I have an HCI solution that handles what what I have today, tomorrow I may need four hundred of them. Yeah, That's and, not and, cost effective. So now I'm starting to actually again bridge the gap between all the different components. I mean, anybody literally can build their own HCI. Yeah, and and it's not a one-time thing. Very few people have the luxury of, of buying an entire data center that is completely homogeneous, right? So you always end up with um, you know a refresh happening at one kind or another. New hardware technologies showing up that you need to integrate. Uh, those kinds of problems are constant. And so it's a very short-term solution, as you said. And then when you start talking about growing, you now need something to – now you have multiple subsystems. Again, you're, you're controlling through different management constructs. Right. And I'm actually looking at management constructs becoming much, more, much, much more intelligent and not just intelligent and being able to determine that there's a problem, but automatically correct. You have to do that. Um, it's part of the complexity that you're trying to to manage. You know, I, I heard recently about 
uh, some people are saying that so the the newfangled uh, data center is you you essentially lease a building and fill it with all the same stuff and as components die you leave them there you don't fix them that's not a typical enterprise uh, typical right. enterprises can't afford to do that because the cooling exactly. and the rent of the space and so forth is very, very expensive. Yeah. And typical enterprises also have very heterogeneous workloads. You know, they don't really know what's going to come tomorrow or next month in terms of project requirements and things like that. So it's very difficult to do forward planning um, without, you know, assuming that you're going to have to have uh, suitable equipment to deal with your various requirements. So that automatically, again, means a heterogeneous environment, which, again, automatically means more complexity. So it's kind of a vicious cycle you can't get out of without something dealing with those complex interactions for you. And we've been dealing with, in most modern data centers, we look at software-defined networking to handle the complexities of networking by automating the, the switch settings and everything I need for a port and connecting apps. You look at containers as a way to get a bigger handle on these bigger projects. Right. Most, Not everybody can use that technology. Everybody can use SDN, but not everybody can use containers to solve today's problems, but they'll probably be able to do it for tomorrow. Then you look at you know management. We have all sorts of management tools that bridge gaps and so forth from hardware all the way up to software. You know, Storage has always been one of those areas that people say software-defined is layering automation on top of it on a homogeneous storage environment, but I don't buy that. Software-defined yeah. storage has to include any storage I currently have in my environment. So, so uh, if you speak to a layperson and explain software-defined storage, you know <clears throat> the image they will probably get in their head is, oh, I can just take whatever I have and, and make new storage out of it. That's not the typical current reality, as you said. That you a lot of a lot of approaches are assuming a relatively homogeneous environment to that. Yes. Um, the the company I'm in has taken. Uh, and uh, perhaps an untraditional approach in not making those kinds of assumptions. Um, and we think we are going sort of in the direction towards what I described earlier, which is a, a very automated environment, in our case for storage, um, trying to, to solve these kinds of, of efficiency issues that eventually translate into dollar signs for the customers. But it ends up being a software-defined storage in my thinking is really about data services more than it is about the data itself or where it lives. Where data right. services are migration, mobility for to where it needs to be, or even modification on the fly to include encryption for government require, regulatory compliance and things of that nature. Yeah, because you don't really ultimately care about where the data is. You care about um, a particular um, value or function of that data, that it, it, it serves some purpose for you. And so from a management perspective, that's what you want to be able to state. But also you want to look at the perform performance is a huge deal these days. I mean, we're not to the point where a terabit can happen in a, in a microsecond. We're not, we're not to that point yet, which I'd love to be there, but, or is it a Google bit, whatever it is. Um, so moving the data closer to my compute workloads, where it needs to be to run faster, is only apropos for certain types of data and certain usable data. Mm -hmm. If it's archival data, I probably don't need that. If it's something that I'm just storing, I look at it once a week, probably don't need that as well. Right, and those kind of decisions today are made um, on a case-by-case -case basis by individuals who need to be very skilled in, in manipulating that environment. And, and our argument is that over time, that's going to get um, initially improved and eventually usurped by automatic functions that are driven by what you want to have happen. Well, and that's the case. What we're talking about is because if I'm in Amazon and I'm on-prem and I'm also in Azure and I happen to be processing on-prem today, but the data is in Amazon, it's going to be expensive to pull the data out of X, out of Amazon. So now there's a cost function that becomes part of this because, hey, yeah. 
why not just move the processing to Amazon Lambda, get it done with, I don't have an extra ex extraction cost. Right, so there's, so there's a whole economic uh, efficiency model to consider as well, and it kind of brings us full circle to sort of data center of the future considerations. Um, we think that the future data centers in enterprise are probably going to shrink, both physically and, and conceptually, yes. um, where they'll be doing what they need to do on-prem, and they'll be offloading anything that they don't need to do here onto somebody else, you know, cloud being a synonym for somebody else. Um, so you'll end up still with a complex environment, and, and you'd argue even more complex because they have to deal with one or more external service providers as a very integral part of what is traditionally their data center. Um, but they also gain um, a number of different kinds of efficiency by by concentrating and focusing on what they really care about locally. I think eventually the data center is going to be a big room with a rack of storage, probably several petabytes, a access some switching for that and an access router. And it's going to be connected to the cloud or be part of it to wherever the day is going to be. But this actually, this rack is nothing more than a repository. It becomes yeah. just a, mem a replica of where data is elsewhere. So you get you can get your hand back on the data as you need to. That's more of a compliance requirement than anything else. Because mm -hmm. once it goes into a cloud, today's cloud, getting it out is expensive. So mm -hmm. replicating it, before, be, teeing it off before it goes to the cloud is probably a smart idea. Mm -hmm. But once it goes to the cloud, you may never even be able to get it out again. Yeah, not in, not in practical terms to use it. You know, only when when you need to for legal reasons or whatever else, right? Exactly, and then you need to get the court of law behind you. So when we start, we went this full circle thing again. We're starting to bring in much more in interesting aspects that are actually outside the realm of IT. Mm -hmm. Cost is at the higher levels of IT. The, the normal worker bees don't even see it half the time. Mm -hmm. So we need to make it available to them somehow, have a cost model for our data. Yeah. But I also need to bring in um, regulatory and legal requirements as well. Yeah, and I don't think it's enough just to have a cost model for data. You also have to have uh, a system that can adjust service based on what you might be willing to pay, for example. Yes. As opposed to being a passive, you know, this is what it would have cost to store your data the last month kind of thing. So it's all about these kinds of feedback systems, <clears throat> not just in the in the computer feedback sense, but in the, in the process and governance feedback sense, and integrating them um, between the human environment, I guess, and, and the automated computing environment. You know, our fabric is an attempt to do that, bring that feedback back into the environment. Yeah, exactly. We, you know, we, we've developed, we have different ways of thinking about it, what we've done because it's extremely flexible, but you can think of it, you know, along the lines of your initial words uh, as a, uh, it's kind of like a data management services platform um, which helps you know customers achieve the um, the integrity that they're looking for uh, on their data, and it's very much focused on data and applications, not in the storage because ultimately that's not what people care about. Now, storage is storage is storage. If I need more, I'll just get it. Yeah, exactly. But I need to be able to manage it. I need to be able to put the uh, bring the bits the, the data to where I need to have it. Mm -hmm. And whether or not that's within inside of a cloud or within inside of a SaaS service or within inside of your data center or just in an archival loca location like Iron Mountain, I still need to be able to get it there. Yep. And manage it wherever it happens to be. Exactly. Well, it's an interesting view of the, of the data center of the future. I mean, on the outside, I mean, I'm far future. I look at the data center as being, of the future as basically being a, a Starship Enterprise from Star Trek. It's just one big computer. <laughs> yeah, uh, and and I was kind of alluding to that. Like a data center. Right now, we think of the data center as being a number of discrete components. Like you will go and select a particular computer to do your project on or your work on or whatever else. I think that it will go away um, because it's too difficult to to manage those resource decisions manually. And you will literally think 
and interact with your entire data center as if it's a single resource. And there'll be management systems that will do the right thing and do the effective and efficient thing underneath that. Well, it's like right now in the data center world, I know there's a lot of people worrying about whether or not how they grow and effectively how they bring GPUs back into their environment mm -hmm. so that they can do analysis and, and on their data. Now they're thinking about the costs associated with that. Do I go and get a some new hardware? Do I shoehorn it into what I already have? Right. Do I go a completely different route? Is the cloud ready for this? There's a lot of questions. And what's the next thing? I mean, when the when you think about um, the next compute platform is already available, if you want to deal with changing how you think about programming, that's quantum computing. It's already available. There's a number of different ones. Mm -hmm. But I don't see the average data center going that route. No, probably not. I mean, even if, even if you look at uh, a much smaller quantum step than that, to, to coin a phrase, uh, which is going to persistent memory, that's a huge upheaval in how you need to think about software and design. And that's going to take a very, very long time to transition to. So I think data centers will do what they've always done in terms of what they need to accomplish, um, but they'll just have more effective ways of accomplishing it. So data center of the future, better management, more um, heterogeneous management? Uh, management of more heterogeneous systems. Your example with GPUs is a great example of differentiation that just happens all the time. Yep. Um, and uh, ultimately fully automated to the point where you can't tell that there are different pieces inside the data center. It's just the right thing happens for what you're trying to do. And that's the future, folks. Thank you for joining me, Ryan. And this was Virtual Thoughts with IO Fabric. Thank you, Edward. Thank you. Bye-bye.